skills. It can be about strategy, you know, conditioning, really anything you guys want to learn about, any kind of question. Uh, I understand a lot of our audience is in uh, Brazil as well. So if you want to ask in, uh, in Portuguese, go ahead. Or any other language that, you know, I can understand Spanish. I can read a little French Italian. If you guys want to ask those questions too, that's fine. But, um, yeah, most of the questions tend to come in English. But, you know, if you don't, you know, if you can't ask the question in, uh, um, in English, you can always ask in your own language. Your opinion on the twister, would you like to use it in competition or are there typically high percentage options? You know, I think the twister is a good move to have as an option with the leg. I will go over it very briefly. I've used it before with some success. I think it's definitely valid. I think that, you know, rear naked choke is king. Like there's no stronger, better position than a rear naked choke in all of jiu-jitsu. I think if you ask most practitioners, you know, what's like a high percentage move, they're going to go with a rear naked choke. And, you know, the fact that it's so common in MMA and submission wrestling speak volumes, even in the gi, you see a lot of it. But in the gi, a lot of times in the back, you're going to see a bow and arrows and arm bars and collar chokes. But you still see a lot of rear naked chokes, right? So uh, it really is one of the strongest positions in all of jiu-jitsu. So to me, I always prefer that over the twister. With that being said, I think it's valid as a threat, as a transition from the um, – the banana splits, right, or the calf slicer to the back onto the rear naked choke if that's what you want to do, right? The twister kind of sits in between those two. So I'll show you guys briefly here on how to do it and what to be looking for and what to be avoiding. Uh, just remember, IBJJF, this is illegal. Most jiu-jitsu rule sets, this will be illegal. So make sure you can use it as a transition. Just, just don't try to finish your opponent because it's a neck crank. And if you neck crank someone in competition – Unless it's ADCC, you're going to get disqualified. Like ADCC is the exception to the rule, okay? I, I think some of the submission-only rule sets will allow it as well. I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, most tournaments won't allow it, just so you guys know, okay? So whenever I'm attacking my opponent's back, you know, so one, instead of having like a tight seat, those sort of control, there are ways of like favoring the lower body control. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create – I, if you, if I have this connection right here on his leg, like this is this is good enough for what I'm gonna do next, right? A lot of people like to use like that lockdown on the leg and they extend it, turn it into a leg ride. Here's the problem for myself, at least for the leg right here, is a lot of times when my, if I'm a lot taller than my opponent, I keep missing the foot at the end. I gotta sit really close to the knee to get a good lockdown. So this is a case where long legs actually work against you. But the idea here is to have absolute control of his hips, right? See, like. You know, I'm, I'm the one moving max. I'm not even using my arms. Look at that. Okay? And at this, some point, I'm able to swim my way inside that hand. And what happens when I do this, because his hips are locked, his movement is very limited, right? So if I can reach around, you never grab the neck. Right? I'm going to give you a little hand. You always go with the back of the hand across his face, connect, tap, and that's the submission right there. Because once I get this arm over his neck, he's stuck. Like, where is he going to go? Right, he can't really defend his neck with. I mean, he can hand fight me with that free hand there. It's not going to do much, right? I don't put my hand here. I go across his face, across his ear. S grip because it's a little bit longer, especially if you have shorter arms. You could go gable grip too if you got, if you can't connect. But generally speaking, this will be longer. But the important thing is that I have control over the leg here, right? See, I have like that leg right. This is I just press lower power a little bit for the max. Yeah. Right. So I mentioned. So if I, with or without the, the leg ride, I'm really close to the, the neck here, right? Can I go for the rear naked choke? Absolutely. The rear naked choke is right there. But as I mentioned, just you know, I have to lower the screen. Just pull the computer screen down a little bit, Max. Just a little bit. There we go. Okay. I can always transition from here, right? So if I get this guy right here and I have this control, I can always go for his lower body. So now I'm attacking the lower body, maintaining that same leg control. So you see how I stretch his leg on that leg ride? A lot of times you could do it with one foot. It's not as tight, right? This is always going to be better. But like I said, because I'm taller than most people I grapple with, a lot of times my legs are like too far down their ankles, right? When I attack the banana splits here, it's important to keep his knee bent. A lot of, I've seen a lot of people attack the leg straight here, and this makes it a lot easier for him to escape, and it's not as painful. I always got to bend the knee. So I always trap it with the arm that's not in the middle. So... This arm right here is the one I'm going to control in the knee, the one that's closest to his head. I wrap one, two. I got to control like a kimura, and I stretch. A lot of times here I'll disconnect and step on my own ankle to add that pressure. That's one, that's one option. Then I can always go for the calf slicer here as well. When I go for the calf slice, it's very important. I don't stick my arm in the middle there. 
because Max can arm bar me. So what I do is I normally tuck my elbow behind his butt. See how my elbow is hidden? So if Max wants to try to arm bar me now, there's nothing that he can grab my forearm. You can try to pull there if you want, Max. I'm not worried about it. And I'm able to go for my calf slicer. I'll give you guys an important hit here on a hint here on the on the calf slicer. You gotta roll your knee into the calf. Try not to have your kneecap up. What happens with the kneecap up is a lot of times you put pressure on the outside of the knee and you hurt yourself. So if I'm here and I lock that triangle, I pull and hold, give it a little arch, and your shin's gotta be immediately on your opponent's calf. That angle is very important so you don't hurt yourself. Okay. All right. So that was a twister question. What is your favorite escape from 50-50? Uh, that's a good question. Like in terms of 50-50, I uh, have a lot of different ideas. I'll show you guys some basic ones. You know, one thing I'm constantly trying to do is, you know, always what I call it 60-40. So if you guys can see here, even though we're in a 50-50 position, by rolling my leg in and keeping it straight, I have a better position than Max does. It's better because, A, he's going to have a really hard time attacking my foot, okay, because my toe, my right toe is on the ground. So it's even when heel hooks are available, this is going to be a little bit harder because if Max wanted to attack the heel hook here, he's going to have to bump my foot to the other side, which is a fight. You know, I'm not going to – you know, I shouldn't let him. I should be hand fighting him trying to escape. So this is, this is one option, right? And by staying heavy here, the other thing that happens too, it's hard for Max to come up. So if I say – let's say Max needs to score two points – or he's trying to prevent me from scoring two points on him. And you try to come up there, Max, like he's stuck. You guys see that? I stay heavy on my side here. Resist the temptation of squaring up because when I square up, my knee opens. And when my knee opens, he gets on top of me. You guys see that? So if I'm here, I'm facing you guys. If I try to start facing Max, my knee's going to open. When my knee opens, he can put me in a 60-40. Next thing you know, he's on top of me. So a good position for me to be in is a, what I almost like a flying sidekick. Every time I like a flying sidekick in a video game, it's kind of the position. I mean, I lean heavy forward, so now he really has nothing on me. At this point, a lot of times, Max begins to use that leg as a pendulum to try to gain momentum to just yes, to sit back, right? You see this one in competitions. Both guys doing this right here, trying to kick that leg forward to create a pendulum. I, for myself, I like to tuck my foot underneath his butt and stay heavy on this side. So when Max is trying to create that pendulum there, it's he's going to try – I keep my right foot on the ground with the reference, and I keep pushing his knee, and I use my right hand as well. He can cup the knee here, and I stay in, and I stay heavy, and he gets stuck. When he opens up that triangle and he's rocking that leg, whenever I find the right moment, I'll get a pocket grip on the leg. And at this point, it's very easy for me to push back. Like here, one. You see, I can push the back of his knee with the back of my, the top of my foot. I go one, and I keep that leg open so he can't really lock a triangle. And then it's easy for me to escape and easy for me to win the scramble because I have a pocket grip. So if we're both with our butts on the ground and I say go now, I'm going to beat Max 10 out of 10 because I have this and he has nothing on me. So I'm always going to be able to come up first because I'm able to pull his leg off the ground. Okay. Now let's assume he has a triangle. That's the most common question people get. Oh, Rob, my opponent has a triangle on me. I'm going to switch sides because it's going to be better for everyone to see. So if I'm in this triangle here, what happens is you know, it's it's not just that I'm trying to get to that 60-40 position, but it's going to be difficult to free my leg even when I do. I'm not in the 60-40 position now because I'm looking at you guys to talk to you guys, but normally I would. So I'm going to look away for a second. So after I get to this, I'm going to get my right hand, and I'm going to put it in my back pocket just like that. I'm really trying to scoop my elbow underneath Max, both his legs, not just this one right here, this one as well. So it's going to look more or less like this. Okay. You guys, you know, I'm capturing Maxi's heel. It's not always easy, especially if they have small feet, small heel. Sometimes it's difficult to get that latch. But what I'm really looking to do is to bite his foot with my bicep. And then I pull back. When I do that, I begin to open the triangle. So I'm just going to move at a 45 with them there, Max's turn. If you guys can see, put your head back, Max, so you can see. There's a space here that wasn't there. So I can put my arm through that triangle. That means there's a lot more room for my knee. Put your arm down so they can see. Yes, so there's a lot more room there, right? That room wasn't there. So that my, my knee is free because I have trapped his leg here on the triangle. I've opened the triangle with my right arm. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to back out until I free the knee line. Back out, free the knee line, pull my foot out. I'm able to finish on top. Easy, right? I'll do it one more time. Here. Extend the leg, open the triangle, begin to walk back. Bring my leg 
and I'm able to come up. The whole time, this is what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for this control on the triangle. And that prevents him from biting the triangle, making it small, making it tight. It's very difficult for him to keep me in that 50-50, okay? So I always say this whenever I teach a 50-50 because the position gets such a bad rap. Like people go, oh, 50-50 is a stalling position, right? And the answer to that is that's true, but it's not the only truth about 50-50. So it's also a great position to submit with and without heel hooks, right? You know what else is a stalling position? Close guard. You know what else? Half guard. You know what else? Standing. Standing is the ultimate stalling position. Most, I think most stalling jiu-jitsu is not done on, on the ground. Most of jiu-jitsu stalling is done on their feet. It's just that we don't call it standing because the other person is free to move, but I could be stalling standing, right? So my point is you can stall anywhere. It has to do with your approach and your mindset, right? Avoid being in positions that where your opponent can potentially stall, like a 50-50, for example, unless you're an expert there. And what I mean by this is if you're losing a fight, you should always try to stay out in the open. What do I mean by that? Loose game. You don't want to get stuck in a lasso. You don't want to get stuck in 50-50. You don't want to be doing head-to-head -head like that sumo wrestling thing people do in jiu-jitsu. They keep pushing into each other. Nothing happens. You want to keep a loose and open game. Avoid grips to keep you trapped. There are some grips that really get you stuck in position. It's hard to move. Lasso, case in point. Avoid a deep half guard because it's not always easy to get out of there. So you want to stay loose and open when you're behind. Right? People that are winning tend to lean to positions that are more – there's more of a stalemate. They're hard to get out of. So you got to pay attention to these things in competition. And in either case, no matter if you're ahead or behind, always have that submission there. A lot of times when you're winning, that's the best time to submit your opponent. And the reason for that is because your opponent, when he's losing, he's going to take a lot more chances. He's far more likely to make mistakes when he's losing. Okay? Or she is losing. In MMA, would you recommend staying in three-quarter mount to control your opponent? Or is full mount superior for control? I'll be completely honest with you. I don't like mount for MMA. I think mount for MMA is one of the most overrated positions because we think of that position as the most dominant, best position to fight for punches. And that's true if your opponent is clueless. But I always believe that high-level competition is your best reference for you to really understand what's going on in the sport, right? I've always been a critic of neon belly. I think the neon belly is one of the most overrated positions in jiu-jitsu. People think I'm nuts when I say this. And I go, how many times you see the neon belly point be scored in competition? And silence, right? Not a lot. Out of all points in jiu-jitsu, other than the back mount that never happens and shouldn't even – it's really just, you know, a mount. But uh, the, less, the least scored point is neon belly. So what does that suggest? What does that tell you? In MMA, how many TKOs do you see for a mount? Or submissions for that matter. How many do you see? So what's the argument? How is this such a dominant position? So for MMA, I don't think it's a great position because this is what happens in MMA when people get mounted. Now, I don't teach this. I don't like it because it's survival mode. Right, Delmax? But in survival mode, right, can, can make sense strategically. If Max is winning the fight and, or even if he's lo you know, losing the round, but he's only like 10 seconds left, it doesn't make sense to try to escape. It makes sense just to bury your head in the belly, grab. I don't think this is great defense, but it makes it hard to do good damage, right? And I back out, he's sitting up, and it really is an intelligent fighting, but it does buy him time. And a lot of times in MMA, because it's a five-minute round, by the time I get on top of him and mount, chances are we got him two minutes left on the clock, maybe less, right? So it's it, buy in time, it can favor him strategically even though I think that's not even – I wouldn't call that defense. I call it survival mode, right? Uh, but as far as dominance in terms of MMA, there are better positions. I think half guard is great control for MMA because in half guard, it's I can drop more elbows. I have a little more freedom to strike, right? There's plenty of offense, and uh, you just have to be comfortable in that position. Side control, if I can keep a loose side control – and when, I'll give you another hint. When I'm in side control in MMA, like I never, I never like to teach this right here. Because what's the point of this? If I keep holding him here, where's the, the referee going to do? He's going to stand me back up. So I always – I like to do stuff like this, all right? So here I can do more damage. And a lot of times I'm inviting him to pummel me. I'm inviting him to either give me the back by going that way, which I love, go back. Or he's inviting him to turn into me, which I also love because then I can start going for the darts, the front headlock, for the guillotine. So I prefer a looser open game in MMA uh, instead of just trying to hold him down which doesn't work because the referee is going to stand you back up. North-south is always there. So side control, generally speaking, is a better option. 
Another great position for MMA that is very, very undervalued, it's not even points in jiu-jitsu unless you're sweeping, is turtle position. Turtle position is the number one TKO position on the ground in MMA. Don't take my word for it. Watch the UFC. It's the most common position. Guys turtles up and the other one on top goes boom, boom, boom. The referee stops the fight. Okay. So what does that tell you? It's a dominant position for striking because your opponent can only cover up. And he stops covering, the punches do even more damage. All right. Even though most times that happens is opponent was already rocked on his feet. It doesn't always initiate on the ground. A lot of times a sequence begins standing. So there's that too. But generally speaking, I'm I don't think that much of ground and pound. I know this is not a very popular position in MMA, but I think there are much better things to do on the ground, far more efficient things. Um, I think that most ground and pound in MMA, if you pay close attention, it's not very efficient. Like the vast majority of it is like not even doing damage. They're scoring points with the judges, but there's no real damage. Can you show a knee bar from half guard? Okay, I'll do that real quick. So, we'll just show a quick, quick knee bar here from half guard. So, whenever I'm playing, let me just pull the screen down a little bit so you guys can get a better view. All right. So, whenever I'm playing my half guard here, you see how I, I bite his knee and I pull his ankle out. Like I'm putting a little pressure on the inside of his knee. And what that does, it forces him to, makes it hard for him to square up with me, right? So, when I go underneath him, I slide my left leg past his knee line. So as you guys can see, his kneecap is more or less where my belly button, a little bit a little below my belly button, right around my pelvic bone. I don't quite have his knee yet. So his heels pointed up to the sky, which means that it's going to be easier to sweep Max. It's not unusual for Max to try to pull the leg out. And when he pulls the leg out, he straightens the leg for me. So now his kneecap is immediately below my belly button. This is when I bite, and I bite by stepping on my own ankle, the one that's trapping his legs, so the, the free leg steps on the one that's trapping his leg, I bite and pinch my knees together. I connect my hands right here around his hip. Just do it lower a little bit, Matt. Just a little bit lower. Just go, just go down. So once I get to here, I'm tapping. yeah, he's tapping. So it's very subtle and it's not easy to get that bite, but I'm gonna go here. I pin my knees up. I connect my hands. Tap. Yeah, and I'm bridging. I am using my glutes. I'm using my legs. I'm engaging my torso. I am using my arms to lock his lower back so there's not a lot of room. So there's not a lot of slack. Wherever there's slack, there's space for him to defend and move. I want to take all of that away from him. So that's the that knee bar from half guard. It's not the only one. There are a few, but that's the one I use the most. You mentioned deep half. Can you show a good way to get out of it, please? Yes. Let's do a good way of getting out of deep half guard. So when I'm in a, in a half guard here, the, first of all, you guys notice that immediately one, one thing Max did with to this leg. Yeah, he got that butterfly hook around my ankle. I, he did that instinctively. I didn't ask him to do that. But because that's actually good for him because what that does, it prevents me from getting heavy on. So every time he feels in danger, let's say I win an underhook here, and he starts lifting that leg, I feel in danger. So I have to find my balance, and that creates space for him to repummel and regain that underhook, for example. So I'm never really in a stable position. So if your opponent does that to you, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of that bottom leg of his. And I'm going to do that by pushing his knee. See how easy that was? Okay. I'll push the knee and I'll bring my knee up. Once my heel's on his butt, he can't get that butterfly. I'll try to get that butterfly hook. Now he's going to move. He's going to try to move me, but I'm always pushing his legs down. If you want a little more stability, control the outside of his top leg and go stiff arm. So now when Max tries to lace that ankle, there's not a lot of room. He can't get the space because I'm stiff arming him, right? Not the only way of defending deep half guard, but you guys win an easy one that always works. I open up my arm and I open up my leg. So he just lost his pillow. A lot of times he's resting his head on my leg. It's not for resting purposes. It keeps him exactly where he wants to be. So I open my leg. It's a very common thing for Max to do is for him to scoot himself up to try to regain that leg. He just moves himself back in, right? So when I move out, I'll push, I'll frame his face with my forearm. I can't push his face with my hand, but I can push with the forearm. And then I'll move myself over to the other side. Very comfortably, I'm sitting on my left shin, all right, on my left foot, and I move over to the other side. At this point, I switch grips. I maintain the stiff arm because he's still going to be trying to use his legs against me. If I can always maintain a stiff arm, it's very hard for him to capture my ankle. Right hand goes underneath his armpit over here. I don't want to go around his shoulder. I want to go underneath his armpit. So his arm, just lift your arm so they can see where your arm is. I'm going to go in front of it with my right arm, put my elbow on the ground. 
got it. So once I'm here, it's very easy for me to pass. I just got to keep my foot free, and I'm going to move into side control. So long story short, when I'm in deep half guard, my favorite way of defending that position is switching from one side where the deep half guard is to the other side. And I do that by avoiding those butterfly hooks that he's going to get around my ankle. I do that with a stiff arm, and I'm always moving myself up towards his head. You know, in a deep half guard, you got to remember this. I've never seen – suppose that – let's say Max is laying down in a deep half guard here, right? I've never seen anyone get swept that way. Over – go back to position. Like, let's move down. Let's move down, Max. Okay, I've never seen anyone get swept that way. In all my years in jiu-jitsu, the sweeps in deep half guard, they're normally going to come this way. They're going to normally – the most common one is that way. And sometimes that way. I have never seen anyone get swept out with it towards Max's head. So what I do is I'm constantly doing – I even sit on the ground when I do this. I just lean over – okay, toward, on this side, more towards you guys. Because if I lean that way, he might be able to come up, right? I don't want to put both my butt cheeks on the ground when I'm saying – so I'm always moving over here. And I'm stiff farming him. And I'm safe over here. So when I move towards his head, I'm always safe. Okay? Just moving in that direction throws him off. He doesn't like that. He would much rather me just trying to – Keep my weight centered. So when I'm in a deep half guard, long story short, I do not keep my weight centered. Okay? All right. We'll get a question here from Instagram as well. There's a lot of questions. Yeah. Sorry, guys. There's a lot of questions here. I will. Uh, when opponent hooks the De La Hiva hook leg. De La Hiva pass when opponent underhooks the De La Hiva hook leg. I think I know what you're talking about. Lay down. Yeah. So anytime, let's just switch sides. So if I know he here, Max gets that that lock right there. What this does, it makes it, it connects him to me. So no matter where I go, he's connected. And if he's doing a good job chasing the back, this can be very, very annoying, right? So other than preventing the position, which is always your best option, there's a few other things I can do from here. I can start if I can beat this leg, I can actually turn this into an offensive position for me. So I just have to make sure that I'm always getting underneath Max's legs here. I can do this by reaching. This is probably my favorite attack from here. It's a great way of defending the bearing ball too. Is my right hand is going to go on his hip flexor of his right leg. So I reach across and I grab his hip flexor. I just dig my fingers in front of the pants. A lot of times with a tag is, right? And when I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit on his hook. So he has this Lahiva hook and I'm going to put all my weight on that hook. Just move your arm as you can see. So that's what's happening there, right? I got the hip flexor and I sit on his hook. I'm going to try to do this in slow motion, but I kick off the ground with my left, and I lock a triangle. So when I lock a triangle and I fall, just turn Max to 180. Can you just turn for me? Yep. Keep turning, keep turning. Keep turning. Right there. Okay? This is where I'm at. So his De La Hiva really puts Tap. on the calf slicer. So the De La Hiva works against him, right? So a lot of times when people do that, it's good and bad because it locks him to me, but it's also bad for the same reason. It keeps him connected. I just have to switch directions and put him in a calf slice. So anytime he's playing that 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 trapping the I'm always doing this. And the second he starts like spinning my back, I dive underneath him. I sit on his shin. I fall back by locking the triangle. And he's in a calf slicer. I just like try to. You guys see his foot trapped in there? Yeah. So his De La Hiva hook ends up working against him, right? And here's what happens. The beauty of this move is if I don't tap him, I end up in a leg drag. Or B, worst case scenario for me, the worst thing that can happen is he pulls his leg out, which was the problem in the first place, right? He had a De La Hiva, so it's not a real problem. I just defended the position. And that's worst case scenario. Can you share some thoughts on sweeping from closed guard? Thank you, Professor. All right. Sweeping from closed guard. A few fundamentals. First of all, sweeping from closed guard is a huge category, right? Um, I'm trying to think here, like, well, okay, so I'm gonna show you something I, you guys, everyone knows, it was always like my favorite ones, is like teaching you guys stuff that you guys already know, uh, already know, so it's easy for you guys to assimilate, but something with a new detail, a new twist. So what I'm gonna do, let me reach in for the inside of Max's elbow with a pocket grip. What happens here is, this right here is very good for attacking like the arm. It's not unusual for when I start attacking the arm, pulling the arm across, Max begins to posture. Pull back, pull back, pull on. Like, sit, yes, because he doesn't want that move on across. So that bump sweep that everyone knows, it works way better here than it does by reaching over. Most people, when they teach it, they teach it like this, right, just sitting up. 
I've been doing it like this with the elbow because what happens is Max wants the base. So if I can sit up and come up here, he wants to put that hand on the ground. But just, just come back a little bit, Max. Yeah. So when Max tends to put that hand on the ground, like look how strong that pull is. He they can't beat me. He can try to keep that arm on the ground. But this grip right here, my elbow doesn't break. Another hand too. When you bump, try not to bump on his belly. Try to bump on his chest. The higher I get, the stronger my pull. When I pull him over, I put him down. So one more time. So it's a variation of the, bu the bump sweep. One, two. And from here, I'm going to go high. He'll try to put his hand on the ground. I'll let him. I like him putting his hand on the ground because I know he can't beat me, right? So I get him over every single time. So that's one idea. Probably my favorite closed guard sweep of all time is this one right here. Also with the pocket grip. I'm a big fan of this pocket grip. It's probably my main attack in closed guard. I'll let Max stand up. You guys all seen this before, but he did ask for some details on the sweep. So I'll try to move myself as close as possible to this ankle. I'll bring myself in. The more Max lowers himself, the more he makes himself vulnerable to sweeps. Uh, over the top of my head, omoplatus, triangles. This works best when he's trying to posture, so if you lift your head up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sweep that foot off the ground. Now pay attention at my legs. My legs go like that. They open. I just open my legs. I see this leg right here moving. It's about to buckle when I pull this together. And Max goes down. I'll do it one more time. It's sort of like a waiter sweep, I think. That's what they call it in Brazil, at least. I'm not sure what they call it here. I think you have that same motion of the waiter sweep. Here. I connected the foot. All right, so I'm going to pull his elbow back, and I'm going to bump. But look at my hip motion. You see Max's legs opening? I do all of that together. And I just split my feet so he doesn't land on top of my crossed ankles. It's easy for me to pull myself up because I'm pulling myself off his arm. So it's easy for me to come up into a mount. Okay? All right, guys, we got time for one more question before I let you guys go. Yeah, that pocket griff is gold, man. I highly recommend it. Got a situation. Someone, some Paulo pass from closed guard. Go-to situation. That's a good question. I've been stuck there before. I use that pass a lot. I have been – I've lost fights because of that pass. I'm going to show you. Actually, the guy who invented that pass, it's called some Paulo pass because – guy called Roberto Tozzi was very, very good at it. He's from Sao Paulo. He taught all his students, and all his students got good at it. I think Wilson Hayes is probably the most popular one of them, and he still uses it. He was here at the gym a while ago, and he used it very well, which is unusual because it's typically speaking a heavyweight pass. But it's basically this right here. So if Max is in my closed guard, he gains an unhook on this side, falls to his right hip on this side over here. And just switch your base, Max. The opposite. Yeah, I'll fold. Yes. And what this does, and now next thing you know, he begins to split my legs. Or start put, yes. And now he's in a half guard, right? So that's the Sao Paulo pass. Same thing on the other side so everyone can see. So if I'm in here, right? Oh, go back to close guard. I'm sorry. So look how he opens. So once he gains the underhook over here, he falls to his hip. He stays heavy on that side towards you guys. And now he begins to fight my feet. And he keeps doing that. Next thing you know, boom, splits my legs. And now he's in half guard. He's no longer my close guard. So now he can start moving forward. So this is how you answer that. Well, let me rephrase it. This is how I answer it. Like, I have them pretty flexible to do this. Most people don't have that flexibility. And in that case, you're, you know, it just sucks. There are different options. But if you do have the flexibility, this is my recommendation. Second he puts his head down, I'm going to put the back of my hand on his ear. And I'm framing the top of his head close to his trap. I'm going to pull with my left foot, my left hand, and I feed it to my right. I just go like that. And I'm going to pull this foot in front of Max's face, and now I stiff arm him. I stiff arm to get him to look away. Once I get him to look away, now it's easy for me to transition for Omo Plata. Right? At the same time, this is a great way of stopping the Sao Paulo pass with that half guard. I'm not going to lie to you guys. That does require flexibility. You can do this with no flexibility. It's just as simple as that. The more flexible you are, the more efficient this is. Okay? All right, guys. Well, it's time. It's our 30-minute mark. We will be back tomorrow, uh, Wednesday and Thursday again, okay? I hope you guys had fun. I hope you guys learned something new. And uh, spread the word. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. And I will see you guys again manana.